When Nacho asked me to check out their new power supply, I wondered if I could even fit it in an SFF case. It's quite big. And while I haven't been able to do that just yet, I did come up with a build that I still think is quite unique. Happy 2025 and welcome to Machines and More. So we'll kick things off with something a little bit different. This one is the Cooler Master Cube 500. And with this build, I mainly wanted to showcase and test the new Noctua by Seasonic TX 1600 watt power supply, which in a nutshell, it's uh, one of the best power supplies bar none. And now it has a Noctua NFA 12 by 25 that's added in as the cooling fan. It is an 80 plus titanium irradiated unit and has a selectable hybrid mode, which makes it operate passively up to about 35% of that capacity or roughly around 500 to 550 watts of draw. Now it may seem a bit silly to do a build where we target the zero RPM mode since one of the big features with this power supply is this OP knock to a fan, but that's kind of exactly what my goal is here. I'm also pairing with the NHP1 here with the knock to a passive cooler, no fan. And so we're gonna try and do a mostly passive, uh, some might call this uh, semi-passive build specifically uh, to see if you can cool Ryzen 9000 this way. I did want to thank Nocto for sending by the power supply for testing, but did also want to let you know that this video is not sponsored by them and this content is produced independently. So Cube 500 from Cooler Master, 33 liters. It's more of what you might consider your MFF or medium form factor case. It does fit a full ATX motherboard. It's unique. And this case, unlike many ATX cases, has a desirable feature. Uh, you can put the power supply literally at the front of your case and <laughs> have that on display. Problem is, actually there are more than a few problems that I had to solve that makes this one more of an experimental build versus one that I would recommend that folks uh, go out and try. So the first problem, this is a 1600 watt power supply and as such it mandates an AC cable and a connector that's rated for the increased current. So at the top you have what's called a C20 inlet that mates to a C19 connector cable. You don't usually see a C19 connector cable in a stock PC case. Normally this wouldn't be an issue in a case where the power supply sits on the bottom right here, and then you just connect it at the back because you just use the supplied AC cable to connect to the wall directly. But being placed at the bottom with the fan facing down isn't necessarily a good spot for this power supply, especially if you want to run it in that hybrid or fanless mode, you really want some natural airflow, plus for a spendy, what, $570 uh, power supply that has special graphics and coloration, you don't wanna hide this thing, right? So uh, with the Cube 500's PSU position, you can absolutely see that beautiful knock to a brown, but the uh, stock cable uses an internal extension AC cable with the more common a C13 connector, and that pairs to a C14 inlet. So long story short, I, I could have gone shopping to replace the internal AC cable here, but they are quite pricey. Plus, I don't actually think that the C20 connector end of those cables would fit in the existing cutout, which is quite small here. So what I did, I just routed the included AC cable internally and through the bottom slot cover. It's actually kind of a long cable. It's actually long enough if you're using this on your desk, which I think you're gonna want to because it's very, very nice uh, to put next to you. Uh, next, I was a little bit optimistic when I started this build, but the power supply here is absolutely too long. It's 210 millimeters long. It's very big ATX unit and it will not sit in the stock inset cutout. So I did have to improvise with two screws and a zip tie for secure. It does work though because of the Cube 500's panel system. It's perfectly fine to, uh, to do that here. And so two screws and a zip tie for security. And that clears the bottom with room for cabling still here. Along with the power supply, I'm running the ASUS Crosshair X870E Hero. And since I wanted to passively cool with the NHP1, I went with the Mighty 9700X, which in the stock configuration only draws down 88 watts package power max. And it's still an eight core powerhouse with the excellent Zen 5 cores for gaming as well. Uh, over the top of the cooler, I placed two of Noctua's new NFA 14 G2s and uh, you know this fan directly over the heatsink. It has a special job of ensuring that air is directed through these widely spaced heat fins. 
but I did limit it to uh, 1100 RPM max so that they would remain more or less inaudible. For the NHP one, I did use the offset bars to bring it down seven millimeters for the slightly improved cooling performance there. It does have two orientations for AM4 and AM5, one of which covers the expansion slot because it's kind of canted offset this way. So I was forced to overhang part of the rear IO heatsink section, which it's, it's designed to do that. It clears with quite a bit of clearance. And since the power supply in the way it was installed, it extends well past the expansion slot here. I was limited by the GPU length to about 265 millimeters. At the same time, I really didn't want to run something too power hungry or something with directional you know, flow through exhaust, which would be aimed directly at the heatsink. So I settled on the dual 4060 Ti, which even at the typical 160 watt draw would not heat up the case internals too much, which would adversely impact our passive CPU cooling and with its uh, heat fin orientation, which runs lengthwise, at least a good amount of the heat will be exhausted out the back. So it's kind of a Motley Crew, uh, interesting mix of components. It's purposely put together for this, this experiment. So. It's not as much a uh, practical build as to recommend, shall we say. Besides the issues that I had to improvise around towards the beginning of the build, building in the Q500 is actually very easy. It's a very openable case. And the Nocto PSU comes with an absolutely gorgeous set of sleep cables that were really fun to work with. For the entire duration of the testing, the fan never came on until I disabled the hybrid mode. As expected, the built-in NFA 12x25, it was inaudible anyway, but it's eerie when you load that CPU and you hear absolutely no change in the noise level because these uh, case fans really didn't spin up to a level that I could hear it at anyway. If you listen to it carefully, you might even hear some popping because it's kind of expanding quietly there and you can hear that sound of the metal expanding. It's kind of cool. So the first question, can you passively or semi-passively cool the 9700X? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, running Cinebench R23 for half an hour, the CPU settled in at an equilibrium of 75 degrees in a 20 degree ambient environment, which is absolutely no problem for the boost clocks. That's about how hot it would run in a fractal Terra when paired with an active Noctua all 12 s by 77, for example, but no fan here. All right. The A14 G2 fan over this heatsink is spinning at about 1000 RPM. The Q500 comes with this TG panel. You might wonder, would it be better to do this with the, you know, a vented or an open side panel? And the short answer is no. Uh, running without the solid side panel actually results in a higher temp, right? This kind of counterintuitive. This is not a bad temp, but you, you know, logically speaking, you might think, oh, if I opened up the case, wouldn't I have better thermals? The TG panel actually helps force the airflow through the NHP one, since we kind of have this wind tunnel effect with this fan that's created here. So when you take that away, it's less effective. Uh, although to offset that, you do now have ambient air directly contacting the heatsink, but it's just, just slightly worse. In a gaming scenario, the setup works remarkably well. I can't see any reason this can't be used as a gaming heavy build. And if you can fit your desired GPU within this length restriction, I think you can go for a more power hungry GPU as well. It performs well at the stock TDP, but I would not advise on the 105 watt TDP option though. I went ahead and lifted the fan curves for this test. Despite this, you will still hit thermal throttle right away. At 1500 RPM, these fans are no longer quiet. It's not a quiet system and the power is gonna start being reduced to about 128 watts. So while you could run this with a little bit more power than the stock 88 watts, uh, given the intent here of the passive build, I would still wanna give plenty of headroom and would be perfectly happy with a chip at the stock 65 watt TDP. Uh, can you do this with the 9800X or D? For gaming only, yeah, absolutely no problem. But I think in order to take advantage of some of the heavier multi-core capability that that chip has, you will want to actively cool it because it does push to what, about 130 watts. So this thing is not gonna cut it at that point. I guess you could take this one step further and uh, passively cool the GPU as well. But as is, this one is already very noise optimized. So I actually don't mind just running this one as is. In terms of the form factor, Cooler Masters X Silent that I built with in the M2 recently is gonna be better suited for this case and cases where it can have that vertical uh, orientation 
since it is smaller, you can just use the standard extension cable, but I guess I'm kind of partial to the look here. But yeah, as part of this Noctua special here, I think it really sings, or I guess it doesn't because it's silent. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this build. Make sure you check out the links down below. Please make sure you're subscribed, give a like, and uh, thanks for watching today.